oh my gosh, people, I was just checking my pharmaceutical supply. I have such a supply of drugs. Like, I'm good if, you know, I couldn't get to the pharmacy for some reason. You know, say a disaster happened. I don't want to alarm anybody, but it's good to have a supply. Um, of course, I could also sell these <laughs> drugs. Um, which would not be the first time I've sold drugs. Here's the thing, my friends. I'm just going to keep showing people that there's nothing to be afraid of by telling your story publicly. I know not everybody wants to do this, but I want to do it. Um, I, and a lark, sold marijuana one summer. My friend and I were fronted some weight. I don't know if that's the right term. And then we sold it to our friends. And we made a tiny little profit. And I went up to New York for the weekend. At the time, I was living in D.C. <laughs> um, that's the funny thing about being white, right? which in many ways is synonymous with Washington, D.C., even though Washington, D.C. has one of the largest and most important populations of African Americans in this country, right? Obviously, because D.C. would not have been built without the labor of enslaved people, number one. Number two, any place of importance is a place where you're going to find black people, okay? Because black people are very important. I don't know how many times I have to keep saying this, but in the three consecutive summers in the Northern Hemisphere, winter time in the Southern Hemisphere, I did archival research and a bit of ethnographic work, mainly of the participant observation variety in South Africa. And when I was in Johannesburg, where I was mainly, I would often do research in the archives at the University of the Witzwaterrand. Excuse my pronunciation, I also don't give a fuck. And I would walk to and from the university passing a place called the Origin Center, which was a museum dedicated to documenting and explaining how all human life originated on the African continent. So even though the idea of black people and white people is an exquisitely modern invention that is inseparable from the development of transatlantic chattel slavery, the, rather, the tra I want to be specific, the transatlantic chattel slave trade. For which race was invented. We do have black people to thank all of us for our presence on this beautiful earth and one of the things I wonder is so much criticism of the Israeli state
is deemed ostensibly to be anti-Semitic on the one hand, but how come the anti-Black features of the Israeli state are not quite ever discussed? Because the Israeli state is a white supremacist state. Like everywhere in which whiteness is valued, light-skinned people are treated better there. Anyway, I just thought I would pop on here and share some thoughts. Um, it's Coachella. Arthur and I fell in love virtually with each other while we watched Coachella together and separately four Aprils ago. No, I'm such a doofus. Five Aprils ago. April 2019. Damn. It seems so long ago and also just like yesterday. Watching Coachella earlier. I don't have a smart TV anymore. I don't even watch TV at all anymore. I haven't since Arthur and I split and I moved out of New York in service to my long-standing vision to live outside of New York. And then after a year in Philly, which I like to call my lost year because it was the first full year of the pandemic the first full academic year of the pandemic. I had been let go of my job, though continued on the payroll of Gettysburg College, but had my space in Philly all to myself, and I just created. I just did what the Lord, God, Allah intended all of us to do, what Buddha intended us to do, to be ourselves, to be free, to express ourselves. And boy, did I express myself. I expressed myself all over the place. You know, I'm sure some people are sick of hearing me talk about Arthur, even though I've barely talked about him on here. I've barely seen him in the past four years. I mean, we haven't been together in that way, but I also haven't seen my parents in more than two years. You know, I just, I came out to Southern California and I've just been working every day to be able to stay out here. And finally, I can stay out here, right? And naturally, now I'm thinking ahead, even while I'm trying to maintain my presence. But Arthur, speaking of being ahead, supplies being well-stocked, Arthur was way ahead of me. He was an improv actor. He had his sense of style and dress all figured out. He was living his life like it was golden. And I felt like when I got with him that I started to live my life like it was golden, but I didn't really start to 
live my life like it was golden until I was living in Philly. Or Jill Scott, among other luminaries, were raised. And it was interesting seeing how many raised homes and plots of land there were. I'm drifting into my acting space, my performance space. I am working on a series of connected plays, one long monologue, which I'm calling Oh my God, which I was thinking of calling this is, I'm just going to roll with it. I actually, oh my gosh, Rihanna. I've been working on this piece called Crystal Habits. which originally I wanted to publish with New York Magazine. But yesterday I had what I knew was a fake interview at Whole Foods on the other side of Glendale for me with a person named Tilly. And I just, I knew that name was so familiar, <laughs> Tilly. I wasn't thinking Jennifer Tilly, but I was thinking it was an actor. And then I finally realized that after I slept, I was thinking of Eustace Tilly, the mascot for the New Yorker. And that was the one publication Arthur said I could write about him and me for was the New Yorker. And frankly, it's only right by justice because they've platformed Ronan Farrow, who arguably has done some good work, but from my perspective seems totally motivated by frankly, what can only be understood as an anti-Semitic crusade against Woody Allen. I mean, there, I said it. Talk about anti-Semitism, right? Fake news, fake charges, fake accusation. But I get it. People tried to take me down too. They tried to keep me from speaking multiple times. There is a time when I got written up at Lehman College in the Bronx by some ridiculous professor of business writing who complained that I wasn't offering a fair and balanced take on the question of the racial profiling by the NYPD of black and brown and Asian people, especially young people in New York City, even though it had been struck down as unconstitutional by the New York Supreme Court. So what was the fair and balanced approach to take? I later won an award for my innovative teaching. It was called innovative, not by me, by the judges, by the institution that bestowed the panel. By the institution that bestowed the honor on me. Then when we were organizing for the academic boycott resolution the second time, the successful time, we were targeted by some AstroTurf 
organization that was operating out of the Israeli state in some capacity. There's an article written about this in the Electronic Intifada, which I haven't looked at in forever, although I should look at it, even though I know what's his face is controversial in some respects. But yo, everybody's controversial these days. It's impossible not to be. Have you seen the comments? People have no idea what they're talking about. They're not even looking at the screen, whatever else is going on in their heads. That's what's coming out. But anyway, and then there was the Gettysburg College situation. So I was like, whatever. And then I was like, okay, I'm out. Right? I don't want to do this anymore. It's not worth it. Right? It's not worth it to put myself out. Like, it's not worth it to work this hard to get, you know tarred and feathered like this you know but I'm a gay dude so I love to get tarred and feathered you know keeping it moving I've been working on this piece of writing called crystal habits and I was watching excuse me watching I was reading an interview with Rihanna and Mel Ottenberg, the, I think that's his name, the editor of Interview Magazine, which was my first job out of college, which really set me up for life. It's like I won the lottery getting that job. And there was an interview with Rihanna, and they, he asked her, what's her order at Giorgio Baldi, the Italian restaurant? in Santa Monica that she likes to go to all the time and she told him where well, I've, I've also been by the way when I was driving for Uber which seems like eons ago because it was just a contained experience but I do day in and day out and here in my life is get up and read and write and video all of that stuff I've been doing for years and years and years that all feels normal to me but you know driving for uber which I did for a year and a half that was a very specific thing when I was doing it you know and I did a lot of recording and videoing about it but um that was a whole thing in and of itself but um the images were of Rihanna wearing nun's habits. Shine bright like a diamond. It takes me a really long time to write, which is why I'm having to focus more and more But Rihanna is inseparable from my story. I mean, I was... obsessed with what she was doing and obsessed with her impact. You know, and I... It's true. I have to say this and I'm going to get out of here. I'm not doing any longer than 21 minutes. But I used to... That, that was the secret to my success. If there's any secret, I just kept recording myself over and over and over and over again, just trying to get as comfortable with performing, with speaking off the cuff as I could. But really, it was a technique to connect to my own story. And once you can connect to your own story then you can connect to anybody else who has a story. And I think what I recognized in my longtime study of literature and also the media is that not everybody feels like they have a story. mostly because it hasn't been reflected to them. But 
But that's the thing about being an actor. I had to connect to my own story. I had to figure out who I was. In other words, before I could tell anybody else's story. And that was always my problem writing fiction was I just, I didn't, I never thought of my life narratively. Because I don't think I fully understood myself until recent years. And that's a whole other story, but... If anybody wants some propranolol, Venmo me. Venmo me for my course on performance slash anxiety. Venmo me for a consultation session on performance anxiety. I am going to eventually train as a therapist. That was my original plan following my PhD acquisition. But then Destiny had another plan for me, but mind you, that's another email I have to write. Thank you. DL. For never letting me stay underground. And thank you to all my friends for finding all sorts of ways to show me that you are around. <laughs>